Everybody, welcome to the Improv Network podcast. This is a series of longer conversations about improv topics that have lots of questions surrounding them. I'm James Quesada. And I'm Bob Wick. And a uh, friendly reminder that we are going through a rebranding process because... Yeah. Uh, improv new brand, new skin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, new skin, new, uh, going into the new year, baby. Yeah, new year, new skin, baby. <laughs> um, the Imp- uh, Improv FAQ is being adopted by the Improv Network, an awesome organization uh, that's been around for a little over a decade, right? right. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Oh, that yeah, because they did the, they had like their ten year earlier this year, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, so we've been adopted by the Improv Network, and uh, we will be going through just some branding changes changes as we do that uh, to make what we're already doing even bigger and better with our new relationship with uh, those folks. Uh, so we can't wait for that. Um, our topic for this episode is going to be scene initiations. Uh, but before we get to that, let's uh, let's do some updates. Uh, let's do some updates. Uh, first of all, like, how was your holiday, buddy? It was it was good. Uh, so, I mean, I, we were just talking about this before yeah. we started, but um, I got an opportunity to to start doing some uh, training and interning at a Manhattan recording studio, and I'm on the night shift, and uh, it's the kind of studio that's um, on call for holidays, and I ended up. Um, having my first shifts on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Wow. <laughs> From, hey, welcome to the team. Yeah. <laughs> You're working. <laughs> yeah. oh, I know, right? Uh, uh, overnight. Um, so that's, that's uh, it's been a, a, a little new development and shift in my, well, it's only, a, it's really, the, the fact of the matter is it's only a slight shift in my usual sleep schedule because yeah. uh, I'm uh, typically up in, uh, Till very late. Um, yeah, you're in night early hour. in the morning. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, that's exciting. And uh, what's new with you? Uh, a good Christmas. Uh, we did the Wick family Zoom thing, which was <laughs> interesting. Getting my my father to do anything technological is uh, amazing. He still has an answering machine. I think we talked about that. That is, what? Not, yeah. <laughs> my dad's answer Woo-hoo! machine. <laughs> I've wanted to use this as a as a bit in a show forever because it's, it's outgoing message is so damn long <laughs> and monotone. Um, but yeah, yeah. So getting him to zoom was pretty cool. Uh, it, it was really fun. Um, the, the exciting news is today, like an hour before we started this, uh, we just dropped the, the submission uh, notice for snow day, or as we're calling it this year, snowed in. So ah. we're snowed in this year. The, uh, we're doing a virtual uh, marathon to raise money for for the Gildas Club Detroit. So uh, anybody who's listening who's interested, check out the the Snow Day Marathon Facebook page. You'll you'll find the link there and uh, sign up, man. We need content, and it's for a great cause. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So and 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 then it exclusively lives on um, Facebook or. Do you, do you guys have a submission email, right? Yeah, we're, we're yeah we're doing submission. Uh, we're doing a, a Google Doc or Google Form submission this year. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah, but we sent it out and yeah. Well, we can add that on the on the uh, if if you Absolutely. want. I don't know. We can add. Yeah, it to yeah. Comments. I was going to talk to you before I did it first. You know. <laughs> okay. You know, no, no, hey, you know, new branding, new skin. I don't know if there's new rules. All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll add it to the comments uh, yeah. so anyone can submit. And, and, and again, much like the whole virtual thing has been a um, cool opportunity with Snow Day is that it can really be uh, anyone from anywhere um, who's doing improv. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we've already lined up some really cool uh, performers from around the world. So this is going to be our first international Snow Day. So we're really excited about that. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. wild. Uh, well, cool. So... Yeah. Let's jump into our episode here. We're we are right. talking about uh, <laughs> we are talking about scene initiations. Uh, Kurt's here uh, for his favorite show, of course. Um, <laughs> That's my buddy, Hi, Kurt. 
Uh, oh, and Natalie just did us a favor by dropping uh, a link to submissions for Snow Day. Uh, very cool. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Um, okay, so scene initiations. Um, you know, I, I this was one of the recent um, mini lectures uh, that I put out. And uh, it's a, it's it's a good episode. I'm happy with it, but I think that there's yeah. so much more to uh, unpack about seed initiations. And I and, and more than anything, I wanted to pick your brain, Bob, about well, like how you okay. feel about it. Because um, I feel like th this is this is the angle that I'm coming at it from. Um, I I want to talk about different ways to initiate a scene. Okay, but I also want to talk about like what. Um, what different what different players want out of their initiations or how how different players approach initiations because some people yeah. like to throw things out there and just kind of be like this is me starting what do you got um right and some right, people are like, good no no oh no keep on going and, 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 so, and some people approach it from kind of like a, a mind readers um perspective where they kind of want to uh, bait you into something or, or or they have a little little nugget of an idea or a premise and yeah. It kind of depends on the show format when it when you start getting into those um, premises or, or like loaded initiations. But yeah. um, either way, some people kind of are offering or hinting and uh, playing the mind reader, reader game, and other people are are just kind of like shooting from the hip. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of talk about both ends of the, the spectrum there. Oh yeah, uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Oh. Um, yeah. Because in theory, like the thing we're taught is, you don't bring a cathedral, you, you bring a brick, right? So you're you're not supposed to have an, really any intent when you when you initiate. It just, you know, you're supposed to be inspired. Uh, most likely, you're inspired by getting a get, and you go from there. Uh, either pick an emotion, a character, or whatever. Uh, come out and do some object work, or or some or drop a lot of dialogue, with the minimalist minimalist thought of here's a seed let's see how it grows you know uh the first ingredient or whatever um yeah. and i like that i do i do like that kind of play i, I like because i like being surprised i like being surprised on stage and the longer you do this the harder it is to, to surprise somebody so you know in the beginning it's so easy like you even surprise yourself like how did i make a good scene because it's so rare and uh, and then yeah. And then from there, it's like, of course, I know how to do a good scene. It just needs these elements, and it'll be entertaining. Uh, and then from there, it's like, what, what, how can I push myself? So I do like the minimalist. Uh, like when me and Peterson play, we we start by doing really slow object work in in discovering what the scene is. Uh, we act as if the scene's already going, and we 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 just happen to consciously evolve into being a part of that rather than you know forcing it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. Oh. I, I agree. I, I, I like, I, I think bring a, bring a brick, not a cathedral is a really great, uh, guideline for how to think about initiations. And I guess just for the sake of framing the conversation, um, we should say that when we, when we say scene initiations, we're talking about how to start a scene, you, empty stage first person or people right. take the stage to do a scene and how does it get started? Um, yeah. I, I mean, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Just, keep just, I'm very excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah me too. <laughs> uh, uh, but typically, uh, maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Tip, tip, I'll, I'll say typically we're talking about the first line of dialogue for a scene. Right. Um, when we, when we talk about initiations and, and we can also, we can discuss whether whether or not that should be the case, but but typically yeah. we are talking about the first line of dialogue. Um, right. I would even make it more specific. We're talking about the first line of dialogue in a long form montage scene. Uh, yeah. Okay. So so we don't have any of the caveats of we're doing a herald or or some other type of form that requires you know. Um, I don't know. Uh, a little more think. I don't want to say more thinking, but a little more. There's more caveats to it than. than just, yeah, we'll yeah. talk. We'll talk about it in all things being equal, standalone, right. long form scene. Blank canvas. Yes, because because there. I think it's kind of obvious, or maybe maybe not. Uh, but 
certain forms will, by design, ask you to to kind of come up with premises or pull from a source of uh, of the show to start a scene. Um, so we're not talking about scene initiations uh, that 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 are applied to a form in a particular way. We're just talking about like okay. You really have the option of of like we're we're gonna we're gonna just do a lights 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 up yeah. improv scene, um, or like you said, long long form montage, <clears throat> um, beginning with scene. Okay, yeah. Um, so a couple factors I think of is where is this set in in the running order? Um, because if it's the first set of the night, I, I want my first scene to have energy. Um, you could, I think overall you should listen to your audience and ask what they want or, and, and ask yourself, do you want to give it to them? Because just because they want something and it doesn't necessarily mean they, they get to have it right then and there. Um, but I, I, I truly believe like the first set at the beginning of the night should, should come with energy to wake the people up, draw the audience in really, really, um, get them focused, especially if you're playing in a theater where, where it's not like Chicago, or New York, or LA, where 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 folks know what improv is, you know, if you if you're playing in a place like Detroit, where we have to explain we're not doing stand up, like, hey, this is gonna be interesting, this is gonna be funny. Here, here we go. We're gonna come in with a lot of energy. I'm not saying it has to be funny, haha, jokey, but it does have to, again, draw the audience in. Yeah, that's. I think that's a good uh, approach. Is <clears throat> having good energy I, I don't even necessarily say high energy but like um yeah. good energy present energy it can be really tough unless it's specifically your, your your style to kind of do slow play um to start uh in in, in a more gradual way but um yeah. I, I my preference i guess is i that i would agree with you i i would want to have a, a good strong energy um first scene and uh yeah. Uh, also, in terms of the initiation, personally would uh, yeah. want to use the suggestion early um, and directly um, in that scene so that people can see the link between assuming you got a suggestion, uh, you know, how you're using their suggestion in the, the improv. Yeah. So a, 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 for lack of a better word, a trick I use or a technique I use, um, if the suggestion is, for example, a location or an occupation, I, I'll play things you never hear. So I'll, I'll, I'll establish, uh, for example, if it was hospital, and I establish I'm a doctor within the hospital because we're using the suggestion of a hospital, I might say, damn, that's an ugly baby. You know, like, that's <laughs> <laughs> the old go-to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Something it, unexpected, sure. Unexpected. The audience, you know, probably has never heard that because it's a thing you never hear. And we have, we're off. We, we got, we got a interesting point of view, a piece of pie that no one's ever ate and uh, it's time to go. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that's a good approach. I, I think just like that keeps it interesting, a, a sort of point of contrast or like, yeah. you know, the unexpected part of it. Um. So Oliver just made a comment, and this will be a good uh, companion to that. Uh, Oliver, first of all, Oliver says, uh, first international snow day? Are Canadians not uh, international enough for you? Uh, he's dual citizenship, so technically he's still half American. <laughs> so that's, that's probably Oliver. I was, you know what, Oliver, I was going to pull this up and, and uh, <laughs> just be over the top on your side about it, but Bob just, <laughs> Bob just pulled a, a, a nice comeback there. So dual citizen. <laughs> now if Isaac or Ken has something to say. I might be in trouble. <laughs> you're American. You're one of us, Oliver. You're, well, you're half of us. Ah. Um, okay. So, but, but, uh, but Oliver then says, um, often my first line of dialogue is based on what I see physically and spatially on stage. Um, but if I'm leading with a line, for a non sequitur montage scene, it's generally in contrast to the to the one I just watched. Um, and I I think so the 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 uh, spatially or, or physically part is is a good um, starting place too because you know if if you're not always take, take if you're not the the type of thinker that um, 
can easily kind of like flip contrast uh, the way that, that you're talking about, Bob, to be like, uh, like, or flip expectation. Right. Um, then just uh, going on what you see is, is a really nice way to do it. And, and then to me, that makes it really valuable to make a physical choice first um, because if, if you're more, if you're less of, of like a clever witticism person on, on the dialogue front, then to just be like, to think of a location or, or the space first and then start interacting with it is really great. And then what I would recommend is like having um, just something that does make sense or is in line with, with what's uh, the, what the environment is yeah. ready to go, but just be, interact with the environment or suggest the environment physically somehow. And then your partner can use that for inspiration or whoever uh, joins, you can use that for inspiration yeah. and, and you're in a really great spot. Uh, and maybe they do something that, that is, uh, flipping expectation or they just, you, you know, use what they see, say a lot of dialogue and you already have a nice connection between what, uh, the first per the suggestion inspires what the first person is doing and what the first person is doing inspires what the second person says. Um, that's a nice combo. Yeah. Also, Oliver says, "Yeah, <laughs> Oliver's <laughs> pissed." <laughs> um, oh no! Yeah, I also Oliver. I, I also hi Oliver. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> um, uh, I, I I also like the um, the following a scene with an initiation that um, is in contrast to, to the scene we just saw. Um. Yeah. And I guess that maybe opens up the uh, conversation of like, how does what you're doing, how does initiating a scene uh, change throughout a show? Because at the top, like I said, I, I would like to use the suggestion in, in a clear way early, immediately in the scene at face value, um, if it's a montage. Right. Um, in the beginning... And, uh, you know, maybe the second or third scene, if we're just trying to like broaden things up or, or not be stuck too close to the suggestion, then I'll, I'll, uh, just mix energies up or, or, um, just make sure that the edits get taken care of. Cause early in, early in the show, I'm also like, just edit, like, don't, I, I, I it, it does, it bugs me when you clear the stage and there's that lingering empty space. So I just like to make sure that that like, Edits are taken care of. You move on to the next scene, and whether you have an idea uh, or not of of um, how you're going to use the suggestion in the next scene or or whatever, um, you just get it started. So um, that that's my approach, and I'd rather uh, keep things kind of simple and and whatnot in that regard. But then later in the show, I am a little bit more on the on the uh, side of like okay, now I kind of want to have something in mind for like how I'm leaning into a theme of the show yeah. or trying to call back a character. Um, like how does that develop for you throughout a show, Bob? Um, I'm pretty much on the same page as you are. Cause I, I, th I think it's our job as improvisers to show range. So uh, a pet peeve I have in mind is I think intro long form students, um, do a lot of argument scenes. So you could be watching uh, an improv set that is argument, 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 argument. So I, I think it's more seasoned improviser. Their responsibility is to switch up like the tone of the scene and uh, the type of characters they play. So using Oliver in your suggestion, like, yeah, I absolutely think if you're doing something in the first scene, not that you have to do, an exact opposite, but you have to do something different in the next scene. Uh, just so when you do get to the middle of the set or towards the end, we do do callbacks. Um, the the characters you're calling back are so unique; it's easier for the, the audience to to remember what what scene and what what you were doing. There's no confusion as to oh, were you playing the dad or the boss? Because both of those were high status characters. They kind of use the grizzly voice. Uh, and had to say yeah. physicality. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a, a cool tool, um, cool tool uh, to, <laughs> <laughs> to, 
to switch it up, you know. Play oh, cool to know. <laughs> Yeah. Play characters that doesn't look, that don't look like what you represent in the real world. You know, play mythological characters, play animals, you know, or play people with different points of view, play people with or or things that have, you know, the different statuses, all that things that make you different. Um and also, don't always be like the lead character. Make sure you're a supporting character or the chair in the third scene. Whatever, um, whatever makes it different and, and unique. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a great point. I didn't even really think about the um, the fact that like keeping things dynamic early makes it easier to distinguish what you're returning to later, yeah. even when you return to something. Uh, that's a great point. That's a great reason to. Um, mix it up in the beginning is, is so that you have real distinct things to, to call back to or return to easier to recognize and, di and distinguish from each other. I was thinking that, that, um, you know, it, it, I think any, the, the, any show at its highest potential payoff um, or success of a show um, is going to have connections in the end and, and right. keeping things dynamic in the beginning also means that like, it's more surprising and um, it's more fun uh, when things that seem unrelated and in contrast to each other end up being connected in the end. So you're also setting yourself up to have like really fun, surprising Absolutely. connections it, yeah. as opposed to like, you know, you're casting a wider net because yeah, you yeah, give yeah. yourself more variety to, to connect with. Uh, if you're playing the same character, you only have a, a very small spectrum and, and, to, and, and to connect like whatever is happening at the end. Rather yeah. than a you know a very contrast and unique you know different palette to paint off of. Yeah, yeah, you're you just you're, you're creating more running space and um, more uh, more room for that magic by the end. Yeah. Really. Well, I mean, we call it play for a reason. If we're playing the same game every time we get on stage or like every scene, then I know it gets redundant and boring. Like you. You know, you want to do something different. You want to push yourself. And the surprise is, where does this all end? You know, where do we end up? And how does this conclude? And that's the payoff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, I, I played with you so many times. And I would say you're kind of a minimalist, but you usually start off with, like, bigger physicality stuff. Uh, you are, like, the object work guy. Uh and yeah. I wonder, like, how do you decide? I don't know how to ask you this. Uh, like, but your object work or your physicality always has energy. Is there some some way you or some technique you use to pick what energy, or is it just from your gut? Um, I again, it's for me. It's it's mostly about dynamics. It's mostly about um, recognizing what the last scene was. So so whether it's and that could be um, energy of just like that was. Uh, that was an angry conflict scene and I'll go positive. Uh, and, 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 and then all of these things I'm thinking are not really th always thinking of all, all of these things I'm tending to in a physical way. So uh, when I, when I, um, when I recognize, okay, that was a conflict scene or we've had two conflict scenes in a row early in a show. Um, then I'll just make sure that I go out with like big, like positive, uh, physicality. Um, or if I recognize that, like, uh, these have all been kind of like arm's length, two person scenes, um, then then uh, you know if the, if two people jump on stage for the next scene, I'll be the third person to mix up the numbers, yeah. um, or um, I'll, I'll just I'll stand mm -hmm. at a different part of the stage, and um, I guess I, I look for the for for the for the things that that are nonverbal or, or the physical elements um for dynamics uh is is just i guess like how i even when i picture it like when i'm like okay this this should be a more of a relationship scene i'm i'm i'm, I'm immediately just picturing what that what that looks like uh yeah. between the two characters and and that's what it looks like is physical you know yeah no i totally agree because i do the same thing because I know I tend to go more for uh, like story. Uh, I like story. I like uh, uh, that's my bread and butter. 
but if I'd done a couple of those scenes, I, I definitely want to make sure I do a game scene. Um, or if we just had a really fun, big energy game scene, I want to make sure, you know, let's let the audience breathe. They might not even know they need to breathe. Let's let them breathe and let's, let's take our time. Um, yeah. Unless I like, unless my gut tells me like, no, they, they want to keep on going. So let's try some, like, how else can we use this energy? You know, uh, cause you don't want to put a damper on, you, you kind of got to read the audience. And again, going back to what I said at the beginning, like, do I want to give them what they want or should I give them what I think I want or what I think they need? Or do, do I want to, you know, let them have a breath so the next scene can be wild again. So it's not just this manic 25 minute thing that we do or, yeah. it, you know, Hey, it's a, it's the, the fourth show and they're kind of getting rustling, rustling around in their seats. Maybe this has to be manic. So yeah, I can draw them in and, you know, keep on the edge rather than like waiting for, you know, this thing to end so they can go use the restroom. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, that's, that's good advice to, to kind of be mindful of that during a show. Again, I think what we're really agreeing on is just like dynamics and um, yeah. keeping the show energy lively. Um, but I think I think in general, like like let's let's talk about how how, how to practice um, the I, see, scene initiations and how to like benefit from uh, how to get better at them or or, or to, to do exactly what you're talking about, like for yourself, which is to keep yourself on your toes, to keep yourself yeah. inspired, um, to mix it up and and keep things dynamic in the way that you perform. You talked about like uh, you don't want to get stuck in um one energy or 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 whatnot and um i think not only for a show that's good advice but like for the arc of your development as a performer that's that's good advice is is like um just be be able it's it's important to be able to do different kinds of initiations and it's also helpful to your own creativity to, to start give yourself different starting points right um you know, so like, like, let, let's talk about like, what are some of the ways that you exercise initiations in a coaching or classroom session? Okay. Um, so when I'm coaching, uh, I actually have, I just make, I, I, especially if I have a whiteboard, this is so easy. Um, uh, I make a chart. So, you know, I, I'm going to, I tell them we're going to do 10 scenes or maybe less, depending on how much time we have. Um, so I make a, a chart. Uh, put one through five, and then I make columns. So one column is uh, type of scene. You know, if we want to talk about, is it a, a teaching scene? Is it a you know relationship scene? Is it a game scene? You know, whatever type of scene. Uh, um, how many people? Uh, who initiated? Like all these little columns, and you can put as many columns as you want. Um, and I have them do a couple. You know, do five scenes. And then at, at the end of five scenes, you know, how many boxes did we check that were the same thing? You know, it, it could be where you were, were you standing? Were you sitting? Were you a real character or were you a caricature? Uh, what was your relationship? Were you mom and dad every time? Um, uh, what status did you have? You know, who had high status, who had low status? And just, okay, we're going to do five more and let's try and mix them up. So if it's, especially if you have like a, uh, uh, a troop that's four people, it can get like the number that, that rough number where it's like, oh yeah. man, you know, like it's hard to to mix it up mathematically. Like it's it's a good tool for that, and it's just a good tool so you can recognize patterns and get in the habit of learning how to break those patterns because you know the audience has the benefit of just watching, and sometimes unfortunately we do the same you know stage picture over and over again without realizing it, you know. So like just the little things, like the little nuances of the show, energy, range, relationship, status, stage picture, all those little things. And just keep a checklist and just work on that during rehearsal because that's why we rehearse uh, to the point where it becomes habit. So you just do it naturally. Yeah, that's great. I, you know, I, <laughs> that reminds me of, um, I forgot. I, I taught this one time workshop, um, on, on show dynamics and uh i did something similar where um i basically we we 
use the whiteboards in the in the classroom to just like name every every kind of quality of a distinct quality of a of a scene uh, that you would see in a show that you would want to see in a show. Um, and we put it on the board and and then the whole workshop was just doing uh, as many scenes as it took to to check every box oh, cool. to, to, to to cross everything off. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was really fun to just kind of as a challenge uh, was was really fun. Yeah. Um, so I, I like that approach. I also I, I, I it reminded me that um, I have actually I, I'm trying to remember what the context was. If this was a, a, a class. It might have been um, it might have been like a form development um, class or something. We were trying to think of different ways to uh, model a show or structure a show. But but we were we were specifically assigning numbers to the running order of scenes and that we were like, let's just have that be the only thing. And it'll be like two, two, four, three, one, two, two, you know, and maybe see if, if there's um, something in, in, in that. And if that's the only thing form wise, if that's the only thing you have to track, is that too distracting? Is it helpful? Is it, is it recognizable? Does it do anything from the audience and stuff like that? So I, I, I think playing with numbers uh, especially when you have a group um, that has even numbers that you want to yes. break out of um, can be really helpful to, to keep track of too. Absolutely. Cause going back to what we were talking before, if you, if you're in that even number troop and you've done four or five scenes in a row where you're just rotating the two people out, when you get to the end, it's going to be hard to, you know, you should be able to, by the time you get to the end, walk on stage and not have to try so hard to initiate because the 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 audience is familiar enough with the character to recognize what character you're doing without you having to really remind them. You know, it, it should be, oh, there's that character who, who walks with the cane and and talks in gibberish and, you know. Is always peeling that apple. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> with, with the cane. It's an endless apple to peel. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just invented it. You can use that if you want. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, I will. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so the, I think I think the lens that we're both looking at initiation yeah. here through is is just like um, again mixing it up, keeping it dynamic. Um, but, uh, let's talk about how, how much value there is in the, um, more premise oriented initiations. Cause I've also done exercises in class or uh, in, in coaching where it's like, okay, here's your suggestion. And, and again, still talking about a montage where you just get like one suggestion, right. whether it's a single word or, or, or whatever, but it's one suggestion yeah. for the whole show. And no promises about how it really turns out. Um, but uh, just taking a suggestion and being like, okay, let's do some that are, um, let's do verbal initiations. Let's do some that are super specific right. and use the suggestion at, at face value. Let's do some that have like a really specific idea behind it. Uh, and let's do some that are like, you say as much as possible using as few words as possible and, and all this stuff. Um, but uh, let, let, let's start here because I mainly want to focus on, on like, on like how, how, how much do people benefit from like trying to accomplish like who, what, where, you know? Okay. Yeah. It's setting the table. Who, who, what, where, and, and, and a premise like, 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 yeah. like how, how much uh, is it valuable to exercise the ability to do that? And um, when does it kind of like start getting in your way or, or losing value? Okay. Um, I, I know some people are anti who, what, where now, uh, but I don't mind it. So I think especially like if you're just at the beginning of your improv journey, if you will, um, setting the table or using what I call mapping dialogue, stuff that we're all familiar with the scenario that kind of fits with the dialogue that you're using. So you're almost creating a map of where the scene would normally go, uh, a premise that we're all familiar with. Uh, for example, if you get uh, the suggestion of engagement, someone getting on their knees with a object work box, 
your the audience should assume like, oh, that partner is going to propose to the other partner. And then we can just, you know, so we're all familiar what's going on right now that sets the, who these people are to each other. Uh, we might have to do a little more object work to, to discover where they're at and who they are, you know, who they are as a person or character. Um, but we're off to a good start. Uh, so yeah. like just do, verbally, you can just say something. So uh, name the character so-and-so, will you marry me? You know, you, and then we can take it off from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that I, I, we and I think we've actually talked about it a little bit uh, on previous episodes. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a great thing to exercise. And I think that it uh, definitely does a lot for setting the stage. And as long as as long as you're not. Um, I think the risk with with specifically who, what, where and try to to. to check all those those three things right. in in a suggestion is that uh you don't want to cram it down anyone's throat <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and again bring a bring a brick not a cathedral absolutely but every every once in a while it is it is a nice uh shortcut or kickstart to uh to a scene and um you just have to be i guess like uh, uh playing with people that that uh see it as a, a gift and not a um not 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 you trying to run the show right 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 um let's what about what about premises like offering a game of the scene in the opening line of dialogue how, how valuable is it to exercise that like do you, do you feel, feel like um you know obviously like ucb and uh right we'll we'll, we'll have that as a fundamental part of their training but in more of like a montage school or, or a community like Detroit, um, should we be practicing it more? Um, does it get in the way at a certain point or what? No, because the, again, we should always have, we should always be familiar with all the different styles just so we can offer up that variety to, to make it fun for ourselves, the audience and the people we're performing with. So I don't think it gets in the way unless it becomes the only thing you do, uh, because I think a fun game scene's awesome. Like they're entertaining as you know hell. So why not? You know, um, especially if you just did a long drawn out scene that that's you know had a full story arc. Why not to have some you know some fun uh, from the from the get? Um, and if you can if you can deliver the premise in a non heavy handed way, I think that's very valuable. Yeah, and so that's the exercise, though, right? Is that is that? Yeah, I, I think I think we're like, in my experience or memory with um, uh, being trained and a lot of training is is like we sure. we practice who, what, where, so that you get used to like creating a a fiction. Part part of it is learning to um, make choices on those things, uh, but but it's, it, a lot of it early on to me is is like. We, we practice who, what, where, so that you get used to um, just being in a fictional world and and, and not yeah. not being in a classroom, not being yourself. You're like a uh, captain, you know, whatever. Um, but practicing it gives you an opportunity to start out heavy handy and just uh, heavy handed and just do it. And then eventually get more graceful with how you're uh, saying it. And uh the same is probably true for for premises is is like is like maybe that's really what an answer is is like practice it enough so that you can do it without it being heavy handed <laughs> right well because it almost it, it's not a guessing game but it, you're developing a game together because usually when you do that that kind of premise based game e like initiation you have a slight intent but it might get manipulated just a little bit because Again, your scene partner is not a mind reader unless you're doing an established game. Like if you, yeah. like if you were to initiate with Twin Speak, where we tweet, we speak at the exact same time. I got you right when you're drinking, so we didn't do it. Uh, but oh, <laughs> no, it's fine. It's Offer. fine. It's fine. <laughs> Offer miss. No, though. there's <laughs> lag. There's lag. It's not gonna happen. I'm, I'm over. <laughs> New choice. Uh, but if you were to initiate with that, just from all the, you know, all the times we have played that together, you would know, oh, Bob's doing twin speak. 
and this is the game, the scene. Cool. Yeah. And maybe we'll need a third person to help us make it more scenic um, because that, that's just going to be me saying the exact same thing, vice versa. You say the entire scene. Or it could be interesting. We can see if, if Twin Speak can be a real scene with, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And Oliver says, uh, premise initiations are great for callbacks and second beats and long form. Uh, and for games where you will have to deal with other set structures, uh, during the scene. And yeah, I, I, I think that's actually, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a great thing to point out for a couple of reasons. One, because we were talking about montage, uh, where you don't have a particular form, um, or, or like a designated way that you're using, Yes. Um, you know, like an anecdote, like you would in Ar Armando or Ascat, um, or in a Herald where you're kind of pulling ideas out of an opener or whatever. Yeah. Montage. Uh, you, you're you're less uh, by design doing that stuff. So I, I think it's a good um, thought to be like, okay, if you're going to return to things, you should do it in a way that that it, you should be practiced at at um, how to make it clear that you're recur returning to things. And it's also helpful to be like, okay, if I'm going to return to things, what is the evolution of it? How am I heightening it? How am I uh, progressing it? Yeah. Um, and uh, and to think about like to train on on initiating with those things in mind also conditions your brain to look for those things so that in the first few scenes, you're like, oh, these two would probably do this or like i can you, you just start to like think that way yeah and then again i i think maybe the my my answer that i'm taking away from this is like just practice doing that uh right. as, until until it, it's more of a natural thing that you're seeing and you can also deliver it in a way that's natural and not yeah. heavy-handed uh, most of the time it's just like an emotional you, you can use the same exact line of dialogue to initiate the second scene or the, the, the other scene uh, just a, with a different or a bigger emotion uh, attached to it. It's the same kind of thing we learn when we play switch left, you know, you're, you're coming back to the scene. We, we have the built in game of, or the mechanics of, you know, that we have to stay the same character that, that when we come back to uh, the same two people being up front. Um, but if you have these strong characters and again, you walk onto the stage, you know, guy with the cane peeling apple the, the, <laughs> your, your your scene partner should join in <laughs> that old yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that archetype yeah that, yeah, yeah. That, that go-to character that everyone i don't has. have many examples so the ones <laughs> i use pretty bland um <laughs> so but again it you're not going to forget that guy and neither should your scene partner so yeah going back if, if this is some if you are characters who I presume know each other because that's usually how this happens or even if they don't like initiating the same with the line dialogue, maybe in a different tone or a different with a different emotional undertone uh, can be a, a, another way of showing like, oh, time has progressed. What have we learned? What has these characters learned because of of either the events that happened during the first scene or events that happened between the two scenes and how has things changed? Because when you get to the narrative kind of things, it's, it's about the event, but it's also a lot about how this event has changed the characters within it and the relationship between the characters that are in it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, those, those, uh, I guess it's important to just, um, keep coming back to like, it's about dynamics, which includes, yep. you know, ways of doing uh, dialogue and physicality because coming back to the guy, that that cane guy with the apple is like physically that's an initiation if you jump back on yeah. and you do that then then yeah like um that there's more way than ways than one to, to clearly uh, call back to things um and i think i think yeah i i'm i'm, I'm just kind of uh, gonna underline the thought that like whether it's dialogue or physicality object work um or whatever it's it's like the, the value of practicing it is doing it enough yes. so that um your brain starts to to look for those opportunities and you can uh apply them without having to think too hard about it that's really what the what the job is of, yeah. of um training or conditioning your your mind to do these things in improv is is that like it can be kind of heady when you're in uh coaching or or in, in a classroom but like if you're 
if you exercise it enough and be heady enough about it yeah. as training, the goal is to get you to think less about it, not not to get you to think uh, more and be in your head more. The goal is yeah. to to do to kind of run reps on it so you think less when you're performing. So you're reacting more than thinking and, about it and seeing natural, seeing the, the natural connections and, 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 and then applying them in ways that are more intuitive. Yeah. Uh, here is, um, a, a warm up or, or something I used to do, uh, write down suggestions, you know, write down suggestions from other, either, either watch, um, a video of your, your troop performing, or maybe when you're watching other troops, if you hear any unique suggestions that once you never used before, uh, ones that, oh, I wish someone, you know, I'm sick of spatula. I wish someone would say something different. And then someone says something different, like, oh, cool. Go home and out in front of the mirror or something. And just how would I initiate it with that? And then cool. Uh, and then maybe say out loud in that character, the line of dialogue. But then, so that's usually your comfort. But from then, like, how other, what other ways could you initiate it? And they're just as valid because you don't know what you got until your scene partner throws something back at you. So why not just mix it up? It's just a, just a good way to rehearse, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, okay awesome. Well, I, I, again, this is a great topic. I think we yeah. could talk uh, even more on it in different ways. Um, but uh, I think that's a good place to leave it. And um Friendly reminder that uh, Natalie dropped that submission link for Snow Day in the comments uh, for anyone interested and able to do that on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. It's going to be a live stream marathon. Uh, we need... <laughs> we need something to marathon. We need people to relay. We need content. <laughs> and we're yeah. doing it for a good cause. So, so do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kurt, thank you. You're a great episode. Um, yeah. Thank you for tuning in. You're my favorite episode, Kurt. <laughs> uh, thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Oliver. Um, and uh, thanks, Natalie. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, uh, boy, can't wait to leave behind 2020 for a lot of reasons. But um, uh, one of the things that has been has made it a lot more bearable for me, and I know this is true for you too, Bob, is, is uh, having conversations on this show. And um, so... Uh, I'm just really grateful uh, to be able to talk with you, Bob, and and with Aww. the people that we have been able to connect with um, throughout the year on these episodes. We've packed in a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you all for sticking with us. Uh, yeah. yeah, man. Like, unfortunately, like this year has been what it was. And one of the things I missed most before we started this thing was just talking to my friends at the at the bar after a show and this is really really fill that void so i uh, thanks man thanks for for coming up with this idea this is great and uh thank you all for listening and supporting us yeah uh feel the same and um looking forward to, to what how it, how it'll develop in the new year in 2021 new year new skin all right happy new year everybody uh thanks for tuning in we'll catch you next time on the improv network podcast bye, bye.